Uh, so welcome to the Interdisciplinary Committee on Linguistics, or ICAL, speaker event. We are so thrilled to have with us Martin Haspelmath from Max Planck. Um, and just as a quick note about what we do, aside from putting on amazing talks like this, um, ICAL is really the clearinghouse for linguistics on and at ASU, you know, we, we coordinate all the amazing linguistics classes that ASU offers. We engage in community outreach. And as we were just talking about, we put on pretty brilliant movie nights. So we invite you to check out our, our website, or um, if you're so inclined to join our newly created listserv. Um, and it's really simple. Uh, the directions are in the chat just send an email and you'll join and you'll find out about more events like this and hopefully join the iCall community so with that i'll hand it over to danko well everybody uh it is my great pleasure to introduce martin Huspelmat. uh he was born in lower saxony and he works uh in upper saxony so he's the original susnuk unlike those in England. This geographical ascent was matched by an ascent is he on his career path, and he has positioned himself as globally, uh, as a leading authority in language typology. His other interests include uh, morphological and syntactic theory, language change and language contacts. In this last field, uh, he co-created a wonderful database of borrowing uh, in um, uh, various uh, global languages, uh, an excellent resource. Uh, he works at uh, Max Planck Institute for, um, uh, for uh, uh, Anthropology, and uh, he's also a professor, an honorary professor at University of Leipzig and a member of uh, Academia Europea, a prestigious European scholarly um, uh, uh, establishment. So with no further ado, uh, I'm yielding the screen to Martin. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to all you tonight or uh, at your place probably this morning. Uh, so thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, tell you a little bit about my uh, research and my ideas. Um, so um, I will share my screen with you. Um, <clears throat> I tried it earlier, so yeah, it seems to to work quite well. Okay, so uh, right. So the title of my talk is "Efficiency Explanation of Grammatical Patterns." Um, so I'm not going to talk about so many different languages, even though, as uh, Danko said, uh, uh, I consider myself a typologist. I uh, look at patterns in the world's languages, but uh, I realize that uh, it's kind of difficult if I mention uh, too many different confusing languages. So I will, I will mention quite a few generalizations, uh, but the examples will come from uh, English, some of them from Spanish. I assume that uh, in Arizona, that's not really a foreign language. Okay, so my um, main claim here is that most of what we can really understand in linguistic systems is due to efficiency of language use. Looking at languages from an engineering point of view makes linguistics less confusing than the usual semiotician's point of view. So I must say, I was myself quite confused uh, by what many theoretical linguists said, and I kind of, you know, now that I'm in a uh, more mature, uh, stage of my career, uh, I kind of realized that um, really taking a perspective of efficiency really helps understand a lot. So, of course, languages are made up of signs, so the semiotic perspective is not wrong, but these signs are to a large extent shaped by the needs of language use. And in order to understand their shapes, we need an engineering perspective, or we could say uh, an economist perspective. So let's look at some efficient systems and so, some efficiency neutral systems. So cars are efficient. Um, they are kind of designed to go fast and sometimes, I mean, not this car, also designed uh, not to use too much 
uh, fuel than the planetary system. It's also a really interesting system, but it's not an efficient system. It's efficiency neutral. Or cities, for example, they're kind of designed to be efficient to use the most important um, things in uh, cities, at least European cities, I'm not so sure about American cities. This is a city map of Moscow. So you see also the, the way the metro is laid out. It's sort of very efficient. You kind of go to the center from uh, all the uh, outside places. And then non-efficient systems would be uh, works of art or games. You know, a labyrinth is a kind of game. It's clearly non-efficient. It's kind of more beautiful. Um, so we have different kinds of systems. And what I'm arguing is that languages are really more like the efficient systems. Okay, right, here's another game, not designed to be efficient. It's kind of designed to be sort of fun and interesting. So an efficient system is a system whose properties are largely determined by weighing costs against benefits. And, and I think that uh, languages can be understood to a substantial extent under this general perspective. However, languages have more often throughout the 20th century uh, been seen under the perspective of the semiotic system. So the basic idea of structural system is that uh, languages are systems uh, of signs. There's a concept, a sound image, or saussure called it signifié and signifiant, signified versus signifier. Um, and uh, linguists uh, spend a lot of energy sort of trying to understand languages under the semiotic perspective. So there are actually quite a few deviations uh, from this ideal picture of each concept corresponding uh, to a form, a, a sound image in spoken language or a visual image in uh, sign languages. Um, so for example, we have tree means single tree and trees means multiple trees. So there's a problem here. We seem to have a singular meaning that there's no form corresponding to the singular meaning. So uh, since 1939 at the latest, linguists have been <laughs> sort of very tempted to talk about zero signs. So, th so there, you say there, there actually is a sign, but it does not have any signifier, any uh, sound image, uh, any image corresponding uh, to the concept. Well, somewhat it's effective, but still we look at it from the perspective of the uh, sound, of the uh, semiotic system. So this is a picture of Jakobson. Um, but, you know, this is not just characteristic, I think, of the type of linguistics that's associated with structuralism. Uh, we find it also in uh, many uh, discussions of polysemy, for example. So this is from Lanaker, uh, 2008. Lanaker is a cognitive linguist and would not be very happy to be associated with structuralism, I think. But still, you can sort of see in his work as the urge to sort of reduce the kind of confusing variety of meanings of English words to one central meaning. So he says the word ring has as a central meaning something like circular entity. And then you get the various extensions to circular object and then circular piece of jewelry specifically for a finger ring or a circular arena and then can also be extended to a rectangular arena. But everything sort of extends from this central meaning of circular entity. So, so that's an attempt to sort of reduce the variety of meanings to sort of one central thing and thereby uh, create this semiotic unity again. Or what are the meanings of the two constructions uh, that we see here in these examples? And brought Beth the roses, and brought the roses to Beth. Beth taught the students French, Beth taught French to the students. So these are really famous um, construction alternations over the last 25 years. Many um, people interested in English syntax have discussed them, and Goldberg's 1995 treatment became really famous. So she said, these are two different constructions that have different general constructional meanings. Uh, some kind of abstract cause possession for the first sentence and brought Beth the roses. Beth taught the students French. So Beth 
uh, possesses the roses in the first example, and the French, the, the students possess French, right? They come to have French knowledge. Whereas in the second, Saint is this kind of more cause motion meaning. So Anne brought the roses to Beth, maybe at the end, Beth didn't get them, but Beth was supposed to do something else with the roses. Or the students maybe were, you know, she taught French to them, but they didn't really learn French. So, you know, that was the, the idea that there was kind of a cause motion meaning. So, so you see this, this sort of urge to reduce a variety of different meanings to a single meaning, um, really in a lot of linguistics. And I mean, I could have cited examples from generative linguistics here, uh, but I think these two meanings, these two examples are sufficient to, to show this sort of urge to have a single unified meaning. And this is actually very old. So if we ask, what are the meanings of the cases in Latin and German? Uh, so, you know, people ask themselves this question a long time ago. In 1660, um, there was this uh, grammar, Nouvelle méthode, pour apprendre facilement la langue latine contenant les règles, des déclinaisons, and so on. So French grammar uh, from Port Royal, uh, from the 17th century. So what do they say about the accusative? Les verbes actifs et ceux qui ont la signification active gouvernent toujours un accusatif. So, you know, even though it's 17th century, it's kind of still quite reasonable. So active verbs and those which have active meaning always govern an expressed or implicit accusative and accusative expressing the thing onto which the verbal action passes. Virtus sibi gloriam parit, virtue creates glory for itself. So the examples kind of are a bit funny, uh, but, but you know, you, this, this idea that um, the accusative has a single meaning, the thing onto which the action passes, uh, transitions, right? A transitive clause. That's kind of a really old idea that we find centuries ago. So, so, so Sir was not really innovative of the structuralists. This, I think this urge has always been there. Whereas I think that the um, kind of more engineering-based approach, the efficiency-based approach is more novel. So it's an old hope to find abstract meanings which are not obvious and which can be found only by thinking very hard. Many linguists are trying to squeeze as many generalizations as possible out of language systems. So, you know, over my, my career, I've read many such um, papers and I kind of kept wondering what it all means. Does this, this uh, attempt to squeeze generalizations out of them really lead to better comprehension of the system? Or is it just a, a kind of radical version of the semiotic idea? And the semiotic idea is perhaps really uh, insufficient and we need to, to do more. Um, now, this semiotic idea has fascinated thinkers, philosophers, uh, for a long time, even writers. So, uh, in 1952, uh, <clears throat> the famous author Jorge Luis Borges discussed the analytical language of the English philosopher John Wilkins. He cites the attempt to create an artificial universal language in which all words are transparent. I haven't gone back to the original Wilkins, so I'm not sure if this is Borges or Wilkins, but Borges is better known, right? And I assume that many of you have heard of Borges. He's a wonderful uh, writer and he has kind of all these crazy ideas about language. So he cites this possible language where the word for animal is a, then mammal is ab, carnivore is abo, herbivore is abi, a feline is a boy, an equine is abiv. A boye is a cat, and then maybe a lion would be a boyo, uh, and so on. So, so with each letter that you add, you add another meaning component. So it's really fascinating, and you can sort of understand why philosophers would love this. I mean, Leibniz, uh, who was uh, born uh, here in uh, Leipzig, uh, you know, he was sort of interested in. Uh, you know, rational artificial languages. So it's sort of an old idea. Now I think 
actually to understand grammatical coding, efficiency is really uh, more interesting or that it sort of gets us further. I don't want to kind of deny the semiotic perspective entirely, but I think this novel efficiency perspective is really quite interesting. So let us look at universal coding asymmetries in grammar. I've been working on such asymmetric patterns for the uh, last um, yeah, 10 years or so, or maybe even uh, a bit longer. And I found quite a few of them that kind of work uh, like singular versus plural, nominative versus accusative, additive, ablative, positive, comparative, present, future. So you see in the examples on the right-hand side uh, that uh, the grammatical meaning uh, in the second column sort of gets the longer coding, gets the additional coding as in book, books, he, him, small, smaller. Uh, sometimes also gets the longer coding as in to versus from or inanimate patient versus animate patient. Spanish has la, like veo la casa, I see the house, veo a la mujer, I see the woman or third person versus second person or attributive adjective versus attributive verb. So these, these contrasts are of a kind of very diverse type, but the examples that I give here from English and Spanish are really quite representative. So there's a universal tendency for languages to have coding asymmetries of this type. So whenever a language has a singular plural contrast, then universally the plural tends to be marked. And when there's a positive comparative, it's a comparative that's marked or present future, it's a future that tends to be marked. Um, the third person tends to be unmarked and the second person tends to be marked. In English, actually, it's the other way around. Uh, like, you know, she sings, but you sing. English is extremely weird in this regard. Spanish is a normal language. So fortunately, you're in Arizona and you know Spanish. So canta versus cantas, that's normal. Now in the imperative, it's the other way around. So praise versus let her praise or sing, let her sing. And uh, in Spanish as well. So I get to I get to that why that should be um, the case a bit later. Right. So here I have an example from the World Atlas of Language uh, Structures. This is a map by Matthew Dreyer, who has looked at uh, plural marking in a very wide variety uh, of languages of the world, and you see. Um, different types. So the blue languages have a plural suffix, the red languages have a plural prefix. That's quite common in Africa, for example. Then there's also plural words. In Southeast Asia, there's sort of often a separate grammatical word. Um, there's also quite a few languages that don't have any plural marking, but most have plural marking. And, you know, it's, it's almost never the case that the singular uh, is marked and the plural is never marked. So that's just one example of the kind of universals. It's a particularly beautiful map because, uh, you know, collecting data on plural marking from hundreds of languages is quite easy. Um, we don't have such good data from accusative marking or positive comparative from hundreds of languages, but all these uh, patterns tend to be quite robustly universal as tendencies, not as absolute universals, there are occasional exceptions, but as tendencies, they seem to be quite robust. So people have asked, linguists have asked, you know, using sort of the semiotic perspective. So if there's this general tendency to have asymmetric coding, must be something about the meaning. So what it is, what is it that's shared by the meaning in the left-hand column and in the right-hand column. So traditionally, people have said, um, I know there's a typo here. They said that the meanings of the right-hand column are semantically more complex. So singular is simple, plural is complex. Nominative is somehow simple, accusative complex. Positive simple, comparative complex, present simple, future complex, um, and so on. So, and then the idea is there's some kind of iconic relationship. Or by contrast, I have claimed that these generalizations are best captured not by a form meaning 
correspondence, but by a form frequency correspondence. In two grammatical construction types that differ minimally occur with significantly different frequencies in languages, then the less frequent construction tends to be overtly coded, while the more frequent construction tends to be zero coded or coded in a shorter way, if the coding is asymmetric. So I've argued that it's about frequency. Plural occurs less frequently than singular. Accusative occurs less frequently than nominative. Ablative less frequently than allative. Comparative less frequently than positive. Future less frequently than present and so on. So it's not about the meaning, it's about the frequency. And then the frequency uh, leads to predictability um, and this is efficient. Predictable meanings need less coding effort. If the benefit is not in danger, the comprehension by the addressee, then the costs can be economized. So in other words, um, you know, if I talk about, you know, some state um, of the world, then you can assume that I'm going to talk about the present by default because that's the most frequent. Whereas when I talk about the future, that's less frequent, that's unusual. So I have to add something. And that's why languages tend to have special future markers. Now, this idea is not completely novel. And George Kingley uh, Zipf proposed the principle of least effort. Um, and uh, that work uh, was not completely forgotten. Uh, but it, you know, in the 1940s, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, it wasn't discussed very much. It was sort of really only in the 1980s and 1990s that linguists started paying attention to this work by uh, Zipf again. So Zipf noted, especially for lexical items, that the more frequent ones are shorter, right? So this is from the German Wikipedia. So you sort of see the most frequent German words are the short ones, the monosyllabic ones. So, you know, sort of only when you get to the, you know, the first bisyllabic uh, German word is in rank 25 or so, you know, but then once you get uh, to rank 50 or so, there's quite a few bisyllabic words. So there's very strong correlation here. So, you know, you can easily uh, look this up in any uh, English or other uh, word ranking. It, I just had this particular uh, thing handy. So, um, so it's not a completely novel idea, but Zip didn't apply to grammatical patterns so much. For grammatical patterns, the semiotic perspective has been uh, prevalent. So the idea that there's a natural mapping of concepts to sounds, the idea of iconicity. So Roman Jakobson in particular, I think was uh, uh, linguist um, who brought iconicity uh, into um, linguistics. He uh, uh, was working uh, first in Russia and then in Prague, so he was one of the founders of the Prague School of Linguistics, uh, but in the 1940s he managed to escape the Nazis and came to America, and in America he discovered the work uh, by the great American philosopher and semiotician Charles Sanders Peirce. And Peirce had under, uh, distinguished between icons, indexes, and symbols. Um, so an icon is a sign that, whose shape is similar to the meaning. An index is a sign that um, has a shape that sort of related um, to the meaning. Uh, and a symbol is completely arbitrary, right? So for male and female, you know, if we um, kind of have schematic, a schematic picture of a male and a female, then it sort of looks uh, vaguely similar, uh, but then the symbols for male and female are completely arbitrary. So many linguists have said that um, <clears throat> there is some kind of for meaning iconicity. Uh, so when semantically simple concepts are expressed in a simple way, as in this example uh, from Borges, uh, then uh, that's iconic. And the idea was that somehow the ideal language should be iconic. But in fact, and somehow Jakobson didn't note this, we often find exactly the opposite. So let's look at these 
uh, words with more complex meaning versus words with simpler meaning, right? So cat is more complex than animal because a cat is an animal of a specific type or house is a building of a specific type or car is a vehicle of a specific type or sea is a specific type of perceiving or language is a type of communication system or heart is an organ or star is a celestial bottle, body or plant is an organism. So <laughs> what we find is that the words denoting the simpler concepts are actually longer. So, so what does the iconicity prediction do here? I kind of never talked to a proponent of the iconicity view about this. They, they don't seem to have an answer. And now for me as a grammarian, it's kind of interesting that we also commonly find the opposite of what complexity would lead us to expect. So, you know, we might say with, you know, masculine, feminine, poet, poetess, well, you know, poetess somehow, well, actually, even there, it's pretty weird to say that feminine is uh, more complex, but, you know, we find the reverse with male nurse uh, versus nurse. Or in Spanish, I briefly mentioned this example earlier, so cantas third person versus second person cantas, it's been argued that the third person is somehow simpler uh, than the second person, but in the imperative, it's the other way around. Uh, <clears throat> in um, Welsh, we find this even with singular plural. So cas is a cat and caso is cats, that's just like in English, but with a carrot word, it's the other way around. Moron means carrots, that's a plural, and it doesn't have a marker. And moronin is a carrot. So the singular gets an additional marker. So are these just random exceptions? I mean, random exceptions occur, right? I mean, I'm not saying that a theory must explain everything. As you know, if we explain part of the data and leave the rest to, to randomness, no problem. There is a lot of randomness. However, the really interesting thing here is that there's a pattern. There's a frequency related pattern. So with poet and poetess, traditionally, most poets were male. So a female poet was very unusual. So you get, you get the extra marking. But with nurses, of course, traditionally, most nurses have been female. And so you get the extra marking with males. With um, indicatives, most often we talk about third person, you know, about others, not about the interlocutors. But with imperatives, you know, most often we direct um, commands uh, to the person who's supposed to carry out the command. So, que cante is kind of weird, right? Telling someone that someone else should sing. So that's unusual. And so, because it's rare, it's not so predictable, it gets extra marking. And with the singular and plural, again, this is um, not accidental. Uh, it's the kinds of nouns that tend to occur more often in the plural uh, that get this zero plural and the overt singular. So we generally talk about a single cat because, you know, very often one house is just one cat. That's enough to catch the mice. But one carrot doesn't do very much. So we kind of need a whole bunch of carrots uh, for a meal. So carrots occur more often in the plural. And so when there's a single carrot, it needs to be signaled. So these exceptions can be uh, explained also by the frequency explanation, by the efficiency explanation. So it was really these kind of systematic patterns uh, that made me pursue this efficiency-based idea further. So simpler meanings are used rarely. Um, <clears throat> so these supposedly simpler meanings, when they're used rarely, they're expressed in a complex way. So vehicle is supposedly um, simpler than um, car. But you know, most of the time we talk about the most usual vehicles and cars, and so car is a short word. Okay, a next uh, section here is about the morphology syntax uh, distinction. Um, that is not so directly related uh, to the semiotic perspective, 
Um, but it's sort of another non-efficiency perspective that linguists have often adopted. So linguists have often tried to explain the properties of languages by identifying modules or levels in language systems. So they've said that there's a phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, and they have, have tried to delimit these levels or these modules from each other. And then sometimes there are kind of really sharp boundaries between them. And, uh, you know, like the morphology syntax boundary has been uh, said to explain some features of language systems. So in Anderson 1992, for example. <clears throat> However, we do not really know how to distinguish morphology and syntax because we do not, do not know how to identify words consistently in different languages. So this, for a long time, this hasn't been fully recognized, at least, um, you know, after the 1950s and 60s. I mean, earlier in the 20th century, people had sort of recognized that their difficulties. Um, so, you know, Bloomfield and Sapir and the American structuralists, they looked at a lot of um, Native American languages and they realized that identifying words is, is not so easy in these languages because they were not habitually written. And so when the linguists tried to write them down, it was kind of often not so apparent. And, uh, but then, you know, after the 1960s, you know, most linguists looked at English and English it was obvious what was a word and what not. And so they assumed that morphology and syntax were these sort of different boxes. And for a long time, I thought so too. But then in um, 2011, I finally wrote down my doubts and uh, said that, look, we don't really know how to segment words in a systematic way. <clears throat> and uh, so the nature of morphology and syntax is, is quite unclear. And more recently, there was a paper in the journal Language by Bruning, uh, <clears throat> where he uh, argues uh, that the lexicalist hypothesis is really not supported by the evidence. So it's sort of a full-scale attack on the lexicalist um, hypothesis. So I, I thought that was sort of quite in line uh, with uh, what I had thought. So what do we do if there's no morphology syntax distinction? Isn't, isn't that a problem? Well, now for the efficiency explanation, we do not need to make a distinction between morphology and syntax. So let's compare English and Spanish, nominative versus accusative, All right? So both English and Spanish have no marking for the nominative, but a marker for the accusative. In English, it's quite impoverished, but we have he, him, and in him, you know, that's sort of clearly an accusative suffix. In Spanish, a la niña, that's a preposition, right? That's kind of not a morphological element. With the present versus future, it's the other way around. Spanish is canta versus cantara, English sings versus will sing. Positive, comparative. Uh, again, the other way around, English has cold, colder. Spanish is frío, más frío. So English, morphology, Spanish syntax, uh, but also within English is poet, poetess, and nurse versus may nurse. You know, sometimes the additional coding is morphological coding. Sometimes it's, you know, what looks like an extra word. For the efficiency explanation, all that counts is length of coding. And grammatical meanings I express this often happens via affixes, but it may happen through non-affix bound forms. The difference is quite irrelevant for the efficiency explanation. So um, I think that's sort of an additional argument in favor of the efficiency explanation, because we, you know, we can't really make this distinction between morphology and syntax. Um, so, you know, maybe the kind of box explanation, you know, the module explanation is not one that really moves us forward. Okay, now a little bit about efficiency in sound systems. I haven't uh, worked on phonological systems uh, myself, uh, but um, uh, I want to briefly mention this because uh, it's not so well known. I think most phonology textbooks don't mention it. Uh, the most striking regularity in sound inventories is the symmetry 
of our systems. I mean, this is something that sort of everyone knows, right? So Japanese, you know, like Italian, E, U, E, O, A. Um, okay, this is uh, another language which, sorry, I don't have the name of the language here on this slide. And here also I forgot it. I think one of them was Hawaiian. The other one was an American language. Sorry, I forgot to put them on the slides. And here's a German. German has a very rich uh, vowel system with a lot of uh, <clears throat> unrounded uh, front vowels, right? So German has more, but it also has everything that Japanese has. So it has e, uh, an U, an E, an O, an A. In addition, it has contrast with an E and A, e, an O and O. Uh, it also has front rounded vowels, but by and large, also the German system. Uh, is a symmetrical system. What we don't find is vowel systems which have only front vowels or only back vowels. So there's no language which has three vowels, u, o, a. We do have languages like Arabic which only have e, u, a, right? No e and o. So triangular vowel systems with three vowels exist, e, u, a, but not u, o, a. We also don't have vowel systems in which the front vowels are always uh, rounded and the back vowels are always unrounded. Sorry, again, the slides here have a, have a typo. So, you know, suppose a language has only U and Ö as the front vowels and only Ö and Ö as the back vowels, right? That, that should do it. Right, I mean, U and U are kind of clear contrast, and U and U are clear contrast, but no language has this. So how do we explain this? The explanation has actually been known since 1972, uh, but it cannot be really captured in terms of distinctive features. So what our uh, phonology textbooks, I think still nowadays, certainly, uh, you know, my textbooks in the 1980s and the one that I used for teaching in the 1990s and so on, they all had these kind of Jacobsonian distinctive features, which were later adopted by Halley and Chomsky and, and so on. So with these classical distinctive features, you can't really capture this. But Lilienkranz and Lindblom, Lindblom were phoneticians and they developed a dispersion theory and they said, if uh, we have the E U, A, or E, U, E, O, A type system, then we get the best acoustic dispersion. So U and E are maximally contrastive acoustically uh, and versus A. And that's why we get uh, these triangular vowel systems. So again, it has to do with efficiency, not with the kinds of uh, entities that a structuralist uh, type feature system would have. Okay, next section is briefly about word order. Again, this is not from uh, my own research, uh, but it's also very striking. So word order um, is actually quite famous in typology. So the Greenbergian word order correlations uh, say, for example, that languages with SVO order like English and Spanish have prepositions, languages like S with SOV order, like Japanese and Turkish have post uh, positions. And we see this uh, quite nicely in the two maps by Matthew Dreyer from the World Atlas of Language Structures here, right? So the order of object and verb, we have VO languages in red, very striking in um, Africa, Europe and Southeast Asia is VO languages and OV languages are the blue ones which are preferred in um, much of Eurasia and New Guinea and also uh, much of North America. And similarly, uh, we find prepositions precisely in those areas where we find verb object languages. So prepositions in Europe and much of Africa and Southeast Asia but post positions in much of Eurasia, except for Southeast Asia, and in much of uh, North and actually also South America. Look at 
You can also look at um, Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica tends to have prepositions. Mesoamerica um, also tends to have verb object order. So it's a very striking. Different parts of the world uh, show these correlations. And so they're quite robust. Now, the best explanation of these connections is that languages tend to have orders that are more efficient and that they have shorter dependency lengths. Um, <clears throat> so Hawkins 2004 is a very good account of this and more recently uh, Temple and Gilday have an overview. So, you know, you can make it intuitive by, you know, just schematically looking at, uh, you know, these types of languages. So either you have Kim reads a paper in the park or Kim park in paper reads, right? So the second Kim park in paper reads, that's what you get in Japanese. So in these, the dependency between the verb and the ad position is fairly short. But when you say Kim reads paper park in, it would be an SVO language with a post position or Kim in park paper reads, that would be an SOV language with a preposition. In these languages, the dependency length is longer. So the distance between the verb and the ad position. So speakers and therefore languages avoid long dependencies. This can be seen in word order variations that we see in many languages. So, so relative clause ex extraposition, for example. So you may have heard that German has this really weird uh, word order. So when we have a perfect, like ich habe gesprochen, I have talked, then we get an object verb order. Ich habe mit ihr gesprochen. That's literally, I have to her talked. So now if I want to say yesterday, I talked to a colleague who will publish a book about language and economics in June. You know, no problem in English. In German, there's a problem. Ich habe gestern mit einer Kollegin, die im Juni ein Buch über Sprache und Wirtschaft publiziert, gesprochen, right? The verb comes only at the very end. If you ever try to learn German, then you must have been very frustrated by this. And sometimes German speakers also find it a bit troubling. So what they do is they use a lot of uh, relative clause extraposition. So it's more likely to say, ich habe gestern mit einer Kollegin gesprochen, die im Juni ein Buch über Sprache und Wirtschaft publiziert. So that the they have spoken, have gesprochen, but the distance between the auxiliary and the main verb is not so long. And uh, of course, English ex uh, relative clause extraposition obeys very much the same uh, regularities. You just cannot illustrate it so nicely with, um, with object nominals. Um, so the drawback of extraposition is that the nominal expression is discontinuous, but you have a short dependency. Non extraposition is extremely long dependency, but a continuous normal expression and languages strike some kind of compromise, some kind of efficient uh, compromise. So when, when the normal gets too long then you use extra position and the shorter it gets, the less extra position there is. So Hawkins has illustrated this quite nicely also for English. You can see it uh, in um, uh, sentences with two prepositional phrases following the verb. The woman waited for a sun in the cold, but not in unpleasant wind. That's easier than the woman waited in the cold, but not unpleasant wind for her son. Now, when the wind gets shorter and the sun gets longer, then you're actually quite likely to have that, right? The woman waited in the wind for her son who had just uh, taken a very difficult exam or something like that, right? So in that case, you would prepose uh, the locative prepositional phrase. And then there's something really similar also for Japanese that Hawkins uh, explains in great detail to show that it's sort of really a mirror image. So when, when English and German are sort of more likely to extrapose to the right, Japanese is more likely to extrapose to the left because it's an object verb language and because the overall aim is to minimize dependency lengths. Okay, so assuming that languages are efficient, how do they become efficient? 
They were not born in the form that they have. Their efficiency was not created by deliberate planning. In particular, languages are not like country calling codes, which were designed to be efficient. So United States is a big country, so it just gets a single digit uh, country code. And other, you know, kind of mid-sized countries like France, Germany, Thailand, they have two digit country codes. But when you have small countries like Malta or Liechtenstein or Fiji, they have three digit country codes. And you see a very similar um, effect in uh, license plates in Germany. So Berlin, Munich and Leipzig, big cities. Leipzig is uh, the eighth largest city in Germany. So they get single letter um, um, marks on the license plates and in smaller towns like Brandenburg, Meissen and Ludwigslust, they get up to three letters. So how do languages become efficient? They, you know, it was not a benevolent creator that made languages um, efficient. So the, the answer is similar to biology because biological systems are also efficient, become efficient through a process of evolutionary adaptation. I talked about this um, last year in my Aberlin talk that's uh, available on YouTube. So in some way, an innovation arises, some kind of mutation as in biology. And then when the mutation is useful, then it, it can spread. It's large, much like useful genes spread in uh, biological species. Most of the time, it seems that language change is a chaotic accidental process, but occasionally it leads to efficient structures. So, you know, if uh, you know the sociolinguistic literature, Lebov and others, they have tended to emphasize the social function of language change. And, and that is, uh, a large part of what's going on. So the utility uh, for efficiency of the system is a relatively small part of uh, language change, but it's it's one part. And uh, um, you know, there's no other way in which languages can become efficient. So, so how do we get this efficient contrast between day and days? Right? Remember, the plural is less frequent, so it's efficient to have an extra marker. Now in Proto-Germanic, it was also a singular marker. You know, we, it's reconstructed as dags versus dagos. So somehow the singular marker got lost and the plural marker was preserved in English. So how did that happen? Well, you know, we don't really know, but English became efficient by dropping the marking specifically where it was less needed because the singular is more predictable. Or Spanish canta versus cantas. We saw this contrast from Latin cantat, cantas, Latin, had a marker in both cases, had symmetric marking, but it was dropped in the third person. So, you know, through some sort of a logical change or dropping, you get asymmetry. You also get this asymmetry by sort of adding something to the less frequent uh, member of the opposition. So when we go to the Spanish imperative, canta versus que cante, where this que cante, comes from a new construction, a Latin complementizer plus a subjunctive. So it's a new construction, something was added. Uh, or go versus will go. This comes from Old English uh, will learn, which used to mean want. So there was some kind of semantic change. Uh, and what we get is a, the efficient contrast that's quite similar to the contrast in Spanish and other languages. Now, what about car versus vehicle? Well, the original word for car I think was automobile. So when people first designed these machines, they called them automobile. And in some languages, right, there was some clipping going on. So in Polish and German, the word for car is auto. So that's a clipping from automobile. And of course, that's sort of, sort of still used in English as well, like in the auto industry, I think you can say in, in English as an abbreviation for automobile industry but you wouldn't normally say, uh, I have a new auto, right? So you would say, I have a new car. In, in uh, Swedish, it's bil, so that comes from automobile. So Swedish has a clipping at the end. Now, what did English do? English took a word that it had earlier and it changed its meaning. So this was the equivalent of the will land, the will future, which used to mean want. So changing the meaning is another way of getting a short form that's for a frequent concept. 
So the evolutionary change, you know, it happens through some sort of random mutation uh, and it gives the desired outcome. Now, finally, a little bit about efficiency in the vocabulary. I think I have, uh, I have like five more minutes or so, right? Okay, so um, different languages make different semantic distinctions. The conceptual space is divided in different ways. So lexical semanticists are quite fascinated by this. Uh, so where English makes a contrast between tree, wood, and forest, uh, German distinguishes between Baum, Holz, and Wald, but in somewhat different ways. And also French, arbre, bois, and forêt uh, is a bit different. So bois is sort of both uh, a small forest um, and a material wood. Um, <clears throat> and in English, uh, French is forêt for a large forest. Spanish has these five distinctions, arbol versus uh, Lenya and Madeira. So Lenya and Madeira are two different uh, words for wood. One is specifically for uh, firewood. Um, and also two different words for small forest and a larger forest. So this comes from Jenslev from the 1930s, actually. It's a sort of very old observation that languages um, divide up the conceptual space in different way. So can efficiency considerations help us understand these patterns too. Um, and I just want to give one example here again from um, other people's research, but I find, find it so uh, fascinating um, <laughs> how we find efficiency also here. So uh, Regier et al. Um, looked at data from 200 languages worldwide to see whether there are different words for snow and ice, or is there a single snice word? So they were intrigued by this well-known um, legend or story about Eskimos having a lot of words for snow and ice. So what they found was actually a lot of languages have different words for snow and ice, but a lot of languages have a single snice word. So they don't really distinguish it, you know, just frozen water is a snice. So what they found is that the snow versus ice distinction is more widespread in colder regions of the world. Indeed, languages spoken around the equator are more likely to have a single snice word. So it's surely efficient if languages whose speakers talk more about snow and ice make more differentiation, right? So English speakers uh, talk quite a bit about snow and ice because where English speakers mostly live, well, not so much in Australia, but uh, certainly in England, Ireland, uh, North America, there's a lot of snow and ice, so uh, they, they have these distinctions, whereas languages around the equator or so uh, don't have this. But is that actually the case? Do they actually talk about snow and ice? So the really beautiful uh, aspect of this paper is that they did a Twitter analysis. And they found that indeed, there's a highly significant correlation between the mean temperature of the place as the language is spoken, and uh, the uh, number of cases in which people talk about snow and ice. So Swahili and Maltese speakers, also Malay and Urdu and Afrikaans speakers don't talk so much about snow and ice, whereas Norwegian, Swedish, Finnish, Polish speakers talk a lot about uh, snow and ice. So there's a quite striking correlation there. And they also, I looked at it, so if you want to, <laughs> if you're intrigued, they also compared Arizona uh, with Michigan, I think, when they found that people in Michigan talk a lot more on Twitter about snow and ice than people in uh, Arizona and New Mexico. Now, I, I sort of suspect that regard as vocabulary efficiency can probably be reduced to articulatory efficiency. So they, they sort of say that it's sort of more efficient to have more words, but, I, but they don't talk about length. You know, remember, I talked about coding length. And, and I think that actually languages which have a single snice word, they probably can distinguish between snow and ice by saying something like soft snice and hard snice, right? I mean, I don't have a specific example. I would be interested, you know, if some of you work on, uh, you know, indigenous languages of Arizona, for example, that might not have a snow versus ice distinction, how, how they talk about 
these are, you know, maybe in the past before contact with English or, or so. So, you know, this distinction between soft snice and hard snice is longer. So when people talk more about these concepts, they're likely to have separate work. You know, why not just say snow and ice instead of soft snice versus hard snice? So I, I think there's quite striking parallels, for example, in uh, names for animals. So um, domestic animals like horse, we have words like stallion versus mare, because we often talk about horses traditionally in our culture. But we're not so likely to have separate terms for tapers. So we talk about male tapers and female tapers. So when people talk frequently about animals, then it's more efficient to have separate words. And, uh, you know, the Arabs um, presumably have separate words, even, you know, about a one-year-old camel, a two-year-old camel, a three-year-old camel, um, and so on, because they talk so much about camels. I mean, this is one of the stereotypes. But I think to, to some extent it's really true, and it's surely true for domestic, domestic animals. Okay, so... Um, the um, organization of the vocabulary also uh, can be explained to a substantial um, extent by efficiency theories. Okay, so this brings me to my conclusion. As I said, most of what we can really understand in linguistic systems is due to efficiency of language use. Uh, now, interestingly, Ferdinand de Saussure, who sort of inaugurated the structuralist 20th century was not, you know, he was not a businessman. He was a nobleman. He was from the Geneva nobility. He was rich. He, he didn't have to think about efficiency. He, he didn't have to economize. He could devote all his money to art, for example. You know, there's this famous quotation on peut comparer la langue à une symphonie dont la réalité est indépendante de la manière dont on l'exécute. So he compares language with a symphony, whose reality is independent of the way in which the symphony is performed. He also famously compared languages to chess games. So, you know, symphonies, chess games, you know, all these leisurely pursuits uh, of the Swiss nobility. Uh, Saussure was also a great fan of uh, horse racing uh, while he was living in Paris. He would regularly attend horse races. So, you know, he, he, did, he looked at all these inefficient uh, things and he didn't have to worry about business. Um, you know, he also wasn't an engineer. So I think looking at languages from an engineering point of view makes linguistics less confusing than the usual semioticians point of view uh, and kind of really helps us understand more. Okay, so that brings me to an end. And uh, so uh, I should stop sharing now if I sort of find the right button, uh, which I don't seem to find at the moment. So what's going on here? <laughs> mm. I can also do it for you. Yeah, please do. Please sure. do. Thank you. So we can open the floor to questions and comments. Feel free to unmute yourself or uh, pop them in the chat. Okay, so there's a question here. No, I don't mind if you type the question. Okay, so there was this question, maybe by Salpi on the topic of snow and ice vocabulary, wouldn't you also say that apart from speakers in cold regions speaking more frequently about snow and ice, 
it's also more important to make this distinction for all kind of reasons, for example, safety or labor. So, okay, so uh, the contrast between uh, importance of a distinction versus frequency of use. Um, so yeah, it's, it's sort of an interesting question. One might uh, think that uh, somehow how important it is uh, to, um, to make a distinction that that should also lead us to have a certain distinction. Um, so, you know, it reminds me of Jesperson who said, look, what's the most important distinction uh, in all of grammar? It's a distinction between affirmative and negative. So, um, you know, there's a huge contrast between, uh, you know, she loves me and she doesn't love me. Right, that's that's huge. So it, that would sort of argue that you know languages really make this really salient contrast. And Jesperson said that that's that explains why there's a tendency for negative marking to come early in the sentence. So he actually tried to explain the shift in the history of English from "she loves me not." Right, that's sort of Middle English to she doesn't love me. So in, in English, it, it has kind of moved forward. And in, in German, we still have sie liebt mich nicht, right? German still has she loves me not. And so, so yes, person thought that German is kind of dysfunctional. English has become better. So the, you know, Matthew Dreyer, you know, looked at uh, negation in hundreds and hundreds of languages, and he did not find a very strong tendency for negation markers to be come early in the sentence, like yes, person said, you know, you would think, for example, that languages tend to have negation at the very beginning, right? Not she loves me, for example, you know, but languages don't do that. Uh, so they don't do all kinds of things, but they don't really do <laughs> what yes person predicted. So importance, I don't know, you know, I cannot really distinguish importance from unpredictability. Um, so, so I would say um, it's, it's more, more, more or less the same, but still it's an, it's an interesting question. It's not off topic. <laughs> it's kind of really interesting, you know, what the concepts are that help us understand uh, the language systems and, uh, and, you know, indeed importance had been discussed, but I think predictability is a more general uh, question. Hi, um, I have a general question. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So I'm, I am sort of understanding, uh, I'm trying to understand the relationship of this to other, um, to other work, I guess. And I mean, I think most, um, I mean, I, I teach phonetics and phonology and I do talk about the sort of dispersion of vowel systems when we, when we talk about vowel systems. Um, but it is true that like in the, in the, sort of formal apparatus, we don't necessarily have an explanation for that. But at the same time, we still sort of accept that it's just a feature of language that it's optimizing in this way. Um, mm -hmm. So what is the sort of what is the what is what is different here? What is what is the new way of thinking that this introduces um, that is sort of in contrast to or in addition to the way that we would just normally talk about these systems? Um, right, yes. So, so I think it's uh, uh, important to distinguish between uh, descriptions of particular languages um, and explanations of general tendencies in human languages. Uh, and, uh, you know, over the last 50 years, that distinction has not been made very much. Um, so um, the idea was since uh, um, 1960s, a general idea uh, that we could find the basic building blocks of human language and that those basic building blocks, so the distinctive features uh, of uh, Jakobson, Tomsky and Halley in 1968 were very clear as they thought that these distinctive features were innate 
that we had them, you know, they were given to us in advance. So when children uh, learn language, they already have these expectations that the features that they were born with are found somewhere in the environment and that the contrasts that their languages show sort of map onto these features. And uh, um, I think uh, that that program was very interesting, but didn't pan out very well. So uh, phonologists are not so optimistic anymore these days that there is one single universal innate set of distinctive features. So most famously, there's a book by uh, Jeff uh, Milky, The uh, Emergence of Distinctive Features. Um, and you know, so in general, phoneticians have found sort of a lot of a lot more diversity and a lot less um, evidence for the idea that there's not only a systematic phonemic but also a systematic phonetic level that you could map this to. I'm glad that I see you nodding. So I'm not a phonologist. I don't know so much about this area, but I heard this from Bob Ladd, who is a famous phonologist in the United Kingdom and who, who told me that really phoneticians have, have made progress and that the, the IPA should not be thought of a set of possible sounds like it's sometimes presented, but the IPA is a convenient notation for the sort of sounds that you know, roughly tend to be frequent in the world's languages. So, it, so the idea is kind of more that you know, the kinds of sounds that we find are more constrained by these dispersion and other considerations of uh, articulatory and acoustic uh, efficiency. Um, and that the traditional role of innate distinctive features um, is, um, you know, is sort of uh, no longer relevant. So Chomsky and Halley 68 has been superseded. And I think the same actually applies to Chomsky 1965, his aspects of the theory of syntax, he assumed that there was a rich set of substantive universals of syntax as well. So not just the architectural universals of, you know, syntax, morphology, deep structure, surface structure, these various ideas. Um, um, you know, there was the idea that there were syntactic, you know, innate syntactic features, you know, plus minus N plus minus V for nouns and verbs and so on. Uh, but, you know, syntacticians don't believe that anymore. Um, so, you know, I just had a recent interesting exchange with David Adger, uh, who was, you know, again, a very prominent British uh, generative linguist, and he sort of agrees that, um, you know, in minimalism, um, there's much less that's thought to be uh, innate. So, you know, you don't get the same kind of typological universals. The principles and parameters um, program from the 1980s and 1990s is more or less dead. Um, and so we need an alternative. And I think the efficiency uh, program that you know Hawkins and, uh, and others have been pushing uh, is a good um, replacement for that principles and parameters program. Thank you. Okay, so there's another question in the chat. Should I read that? Read that out again, Saipi. Uh, when you say that languages should be viewed as efficient systems, and efficiency implies someone doing something, for whom is a system efficient? Are we talking about the speaker? Speaker uh, makes less effort to speak about the more frequent things because I'm imagining how the hero benefits from a language system being efficient. So, so the answer is it has to be efficient for both. Um, so uh, the speaker is more active in that the speaker, uh, or I should say perhaps the producer, because uh, we don't want to uh, privilege uh, spoken language too much. So, you know, I don't say producer right away, but you know, I think producer addressee is something that we can generally use also for sign languages and the principles are very much the same. So 
So pro producers uh, introduce innovation. So like they shorten from automobile to auto or they change the meaning of will go from wants to go to you know go in the future. So it's the producers that have more potential uh, to, to shift languages in ways that are efficient, but, but they shift because they constantly have the needs of the addressees in mind. So the addressees uh, need language systems that give sufficient information. Um, but uh, producers need language systems in which the sufficient information is conveyed with minimal articulatory effort. So it's, it's really efficient for both. It's not just the producer, it's not just the uh, addressee. In, in some theories of uh, language change, there's sort of a privilege of the hearer. So in Ohala's theory of sound change, uh, I think it was sort of the misinterpretation of the hearer that plays a greater role. And in John Bybee's theory of sound change, it's really more the um, routinization uh, on the side of the speaker that plays a role. Whereas in this theory, it's really uh, both the needs of the producer and the addressee. Can I also ask a quite um, quite basic question? Um, so I'm coming to this from a radically different background. Um, so this would be, like I said, very basic. So there was, um, and, and thank you so much for this really excellent talk. Um, you know, we all, I think we all enjoyed it immensely. Um, I, I guess there was a, a moment in the slides where you spoke about um, one of the motivations for this kind of efficient system. and. Um, I think um, if I remember correctly, you were talking about sort of an evolutionary perspective, right? So I guess my question there is really, um, if we're thinking about efficient systems, are we thinking about them as efficient from beginning to end? Because evolution suggests that there might've been a moment when a system wasn't efficient, right? And, or are we saying they were efficient differently previously? I mean, because if we're thinking about development and we're thinking about a development towards increased efficiency, then surely that suggests there was a moment in time when there was less efficiency. But that I think obviously, I mean, we're not imagining a system where in a thousand years, we're all going to be speaking in that, um, that, that language that you uh, described the wilkins borges um, system where everything is maximally efficient, right? So. I guess my, my question is when one invokes this idea of, of evolution, we're thinking about what adapting in different for, different forms of efficiency. I, I just kind of wanted to get a little bit, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really a good question. I, I didn't uh, elaborate so much on the evolutionary aspect. So in, in um, biological evolution, uh, we get a lot of change, but we don't really get increased efficiency, right? So we, you know, we have cha get change from um, sea animals to land animals, for example. That's not incre increased efficiency. That's some sea animals, um, you know, finding a way to adapt to new habitats. And, uh, you know, then some of the land animals starting to fly, you know, again, uh, you know, adapting to kind of new ways of, of living, of foraging and, and so on. And, you know, you know, species or subspecies conquering, you know, harsher environments like, you know, desert or very cold um, <clears throat> geographical regions and so on. And so, so in biology, there's, there's all these different um, natural environments and we don't really have that in human language. Human languages all inhabit the same environment. So, so what we really have is uh, languages that differ uh, slightly, a little bit like, you know, species on different islands, you know, they, I think biologists have talked about this. I think they found it, for instance, with lizards on the different Caribbean islands. So, so you sort of see on the different Caribbean islands, they sort of all have different lizard species um, and they differ in random ways, 
but they're sort of adapted to their environment. So you have these tree living lizards and the ground living lizards and the, those that live specifically on the stems of trees and so on. And um, they, they differ in random ways. So, so basically the differences between languages are random and what's similar is the efficiency. And, and for, you know, for us, of course, what's the most striking is all these random differences. Uh, and they're huge random differences, right? It's, it's extremely difficult to learn a different language. Uh, but, but what we can explain by efficiency or by evolutionary adaptation is only the similarities. And the similarities, uh, you know, they, they also vary a little bit, but much less. So when a language loses a singular plural contrast, uh, for example, you know, like in French, you know, it's almost lost. Um, so, you know, but French has sort of reintroduced it, but in a different way. So, you know, like Latin had a difference between gat, gato, gatos for cat. French has only le chat, le chat, right? Un chat, des chats. So, so French has these, these article marked uh, plural. So, you know, it kind of reintroduces it and there is no overall gain in efficiency. So it's not that languages earlier were less efficient, just like organisms weren't earlier less efficient. Organisms branched out to different habitats, languages didn't. Languages always inhabited the same space, namely the speaker community or a signer community uh, that they inhabit, so to speak. And the changes are random. Um, and, you know, sometimes some things get lost and then they get replaced again. So that makes it a bit hard to conceive of language change as evolutionary adaptation because we sort of think in biology that there is sort of, you know, greater efficiency, but actually there isn't. It's just a new, it's just new habitats, new, new ways of foraging, but not, not really more efficient efficiency. I mean, humans maybe are, you know, better because they, you know, humans, you know, we think that we somehow conquer, conquer the world, but, you know, in the end, you know, the, the insects will survive us, surely. So in a way, in a way it's really the insects uh, that dominate the planet. Thank you. I, I would be interested in how you uh, see the interrelationship between the context and efficiency and how the context defines efficiency. For example, uh, people who work on Wall Street would uh, abbreviate compensation into comp, and that's efficient because it's frequent, it is shorter. However, it is an equally frequent word in legal contracts, but nobody would ever um, uh, abbreviate it because the efficiency there is to be uh, precise. So how do you see, I mean, uh, it's also a kind of uh, ecological question because the ecological niche in uh, the living world would define what is efficient and what is not efficient. And then connected to that, uh, given the context, if you talk about frequency and you gave frequencies, frequency data of today, uh, which uh, seems not to be relevant to explain what do we have uh, the frequency data of the time when certain features evolved would be uh, relevant, but then there is a catch-22 because you cannot really analyze the frequency in most languages uh, of the general use of language at the time when these uh, parameters were set. So how do you solve this? Were there any attempts to kind of mock the frequency of use or to kind of best estimate it without having the data? Right, yeah, so um, frequency of use is not always uniform across languages, but I kind of made that assumption. Uh, you know, that's be because I looked at these very basic grammatical distinctions, singular, plural, second versus third person, imperative versus indicative, and, and, and so on. So these really don't seem to vary across cultures and across subcultures. So there, I wouldn't expect any differences. Um, <clears throat> and to some extent, uh, you know, people have made counts. So we, we have 
actually made some counts in a range of corpora, and we found very robust asymmetries between singular and plural, for example, and between present and future. I mean, there's some difference between languages, but, but overall, there's a really an extremely strong uh, tendency also in, in corpora. Of course, for the smaller languages, we don't have such big corpora and we don't have the very good tools. But, you know, I think my theory can also be taken as a challenge to test it. You know, if you have a sort of small corpus of a small language or so, you know, you can, you can ask your students, you know, undergraduates, you know, just look at this text and check whether this guy is right. Because I make, I make these outrageously general claims about universal frequency asymmetries. And um, so far, they have mostly uh, held up. Now, the thing you mentioned first about Wall Street bankers having specific abbrevi abbreviations, of course, there's subcommunities, and subcommunities sometimes use shorter expressions. So, you know, syntacticians talk about NPs, uh, and but you know, not all of you might be syntacticians, so I use this more elaborate expression, you know, nominal expression, because I don't want to use sort of in-group uh, jargon. But then, of course, uh, you know, many of the words that I use are kind of in-group jargon. And if, if I spoke to an even wider group of people, then I would have to expand even longer. So, you know, there's, there's all these different sub-communities that I have to, to um, adapt to. And actually, I I struggled a little bit in sort of preparing also in talking because I don't know you guys very well. I think it's only Tyler Peterson that I met, right? Tyler was in Leipzig at some point at a conference that we organized, but everyone else, I'm, I'm not sure if, if I met. And I kind of don't know what you're work, working on, but I sort of, you know, I assumed a generic uh, audience that's informed about linguistics. <laughs> Uh, but, it, you know, the, the more you know about your audience, the easier it is to find just the right level of length or shortness uh, of expression. And, uh, um, you know, I think that's, you know, many of us can relate to that. And, and I think that really explains a huge amount. It explains why you get all these abbreviations in jargons. Hi, Martin. I'm going to take that as my cue to say hello. Hello, Tyler. <laughs> How are you doing? And thank you. I'll turn my video on here, too. And thank you for virtually visiting us. It's nice to see you again. And thanks for that talk. I have sort of a, I don't know, kind of just free association here. Um, I was rereading Ziff recently because I've always been fascinated by that. I do a little module on Ziff in my class. Right. Because, you know, it's like you look at the, you look at what, what it actually does, the distribution, and and it's like, wow, that actually seems to work. But the linguist in me, the sort of reflex that I have is like, how and why? Why should that work that way? Because if you take it outside of English, sort of picking up on, on an earlier point, you know, the devil's in the details and how you develop a methodology that tests these claims. And, you know, as soon, even within the European languages, okay, so zip says the is the most frequent word, and then it's the logical connectives and some prepositions and things. So that kind of makes sense because of their high functionality. And, um, but even, okay, take a look at Swedish or Romanian, which ha they've got suffixal definite determiners. So morphologically, it's a different thing. It's a suffix. Um, and then in languages, especially Native American languages, definite determiners aren't don't even exist lexically at least or morphologically they're gone and they've got different sort of constructions and strategies for achieving the meaning of a definite description so there's a couple things here are we is zip for predicting the definite the meaning behind a definite description and then the logical connectives that's what's prominent or is it is it a claim about the form like the language itself um Pipash, a language that I work on here, this is in Phoenix, indigenous language here, we're trying to find logical connectives and they're not easy to find. For example, and, like lexical conjunction, logical conjunction. Um, does that say something about Pipash then, that it's more efficient because they've managed to, there's also no definite determiners. So uh, it's sort of, so this is just free association and, and yeah, so no, no, very good, Really very good question. Um, there was an old article by 
my colleague David Gill, Aristotle goes to Arizona and found, finds a language without and <laughs> I think he was talking about the same That's language. Right. Maricopa, and I followed called, up on that article and I tried and I was like, That's really podcast. interesting. And, right. and, and so I and I work with speakers. What's yeah. this all about? Because it's a bit tempting from the outside to look at a limited data set and say there's no and. You have to sit down with people, right? You really yeah. got to do the to yeah. dig in there with actual speakers and um, yeah. at least the tradition that I was trained in. And it, in, yeah. indeed, I don't know if I'm not asking the right question. Anyway, I can go you know, on about that, but it's I, really the how do we? Is very, the question is very good. Um, <clears throat> so it you know the, there's one question. What should you count? Should you count the words or should you count the meanings? And uh, the answer is not completely straightforward. Uh, Zipf obviously counted the words of English, but he sort of looked at English and at some European languages, you know, maybe some Sanskrit and Latin or so, you know, the sort of prestige languages of the time. Um, <clears throat> but um, he didn't worry so much about cross-linguistic claims. Um, now, I worry a lot about cross-linguistic claims and I ask myself, now, if I make the claim that uh, plural is universally more frequent than singular, now, how do I test that in a Japanese corpus? For example, you know, Japanese um, doesn't make a regular singular plural distinction with nouns. Um, so, so how do I test that? What, what, is, what is it, you know, when I say that really these frequency asymmetries are universal, um, and I think the, um, the claim that I make is uh, meanings that are comparison meanings. And if I ask the speaker about a comparison meaning, does this meaning occur here? But it's, it's, it's a bit tricky. So, you know, I, I think I could probably go through a Japanese corpus and ask a Japanese speaker if they think that the thing is, uh, you know, the, the, the <laughs> noun, you know, is, is a multitude or is a single entity. You know, just like uh, presumably, you know, the Japanese might ask so how often do you use a honorific in English, right? And in English, we don't have an honorific. Okay, so once you, you know, it actually even applies to, to German, right? So German has a contrast between do and z. So, you know, speaking to Tyler, would I use do to you or would I use z to you, right? So I had to sort of make a judgment, uh, you know, where in my social space do you fit? And so in my English, is my English you, is it a z type or is it a do type? You. I think I can make that judgment. So, you know, to the extent that these meanings can be thought of as kind of universal, conceptual, language independent, and to some extent I have to do that. But fortunately, most of the time, uh, the, the meanings that languages have are similar enough so I can take the grammatical forms as proxies. So, for example, accusative or comparative forms of adjectives. Uh, or, you know, present tense, future tense, and so on. You know, there's sort of a lot of discussion of, you know, irrealis, you know, some languages don't have sort of real future tense. Also English, there's a will future, there's a gonna future, and so on, a lot of, lot of subtlety. Um, so, you know, for, for the actual counting, I have to, you know, use some proxies. But the proxies are <laughs> sort of, you know, not that difficult, you know, they, they, they're not a major challenge in this enterprise. But your question was really very good, so I'm glad you asked it to remind me that in the in the book that I'm trying to write, I have to address that, that question. Yes. Thank you for that. Just a quick follow-up question. Whenever, you know, in a discussion of case, and I might have missed a little bit because my connection failed, but, you know, for in, from a semantic perspective, case is more or less meaningless. It's about grammatical relations, right? So it's, that's what it's about. It's not, what does this, what does, you know, the accusative case mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's marking a grammatical relation. So do we have to control for that then? Things that don't have meaning, at least, I mean, that's a bit of a, yeah. I mean, there's some bias there on my part, but do we count these things that are 
that they're that mark grammatical relations that they're not so much about semantics well, i think you know it's you're, you're right of course that we sort of use this term grammatical relations i i prefer the term syntactic roles so i'd say subject and object are syntactic roles uh, but to the extent that subject and object are comparable across languages they're really based on uh, you know something like semantic uh, so kind of semantic core and I think the patient is a semantic core of the object and the agent is a semantic core of the subject so um, you know as a typologist you know Dixon has made this distinction between s that's a single intransitive argument and then there's the a and the p the agent and the patient so use this a and p these more abstract terms because in many languages agent marking and patient marking actually generalizes to more verbs so most languages also use these transitive verbs not only for really agent patient verbs like kill and break uh, and, and cut, but also for verbs like see um, and um, uh, you know, sometimes even like and, and so on, so experiential verbs. Uh, but we can sort of leave them aside and actually just compare agent and patient. And that gives us more or less what most people mean by subject and object. So when Matthew Dry looks at subject verb object, you know, maybe he just looks at agent, at agent, verb, patient, or agent, agent, noun, action, word, patient, noun, and and uh, you know can sort of leave the others to the fringe because for comparative purposes, we don't need these fringe phenomena. We can just focus on the core, and in you know almost all languages, this core of agent, patient, verb generalizes to many other verbs. In a kind of more interesting and and uh, messy way. Thank you so much for that. So it's a kind of coming to uh, 1130. And I know many people have uh, have 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 to go. Um, this is defense season. Uh, so many of us are in the thick of that. I wanted to thank you again for such an amazing and um, informative talk. I know that we all learned so much. And um, for those of you who weren't here in the beginning and you haven't joined the um, I call listserv, if you are interested in these kinds of events, please do join the listserv, it's really easy. Um, and uh, it's in the chat, uh, just send an email and um, I will add you. And thank you again, Professor Haspelmath for that really amazing talk. And um, I guess everyone, I hope you all have an amazing weekend. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again also for your very good questions. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Martin, bye-bye. <laughs>